save 10% with my code Bobby10. Just kidding, guys. Today's offer is much greater than a saving of 10%. I teamed up with my Muslim brothers and we created Pure Passage. Imagine sending the reward of Umrah this Ramadan to someone you really loved but had already departed from this dunya. Or they're really sick and they cannot perform Umrah at all. Imagine the feeling of honoring his or her memory and expressing your love and devotion while still ensuring that they receive this gift. The reward of performing Umrah. As a new revert, I just learned about this, but you know better than me that performing Umrah is a profound spiritual journey that most Muslims aspire to undertake and you understand the rewards of it. However, for some, this journey can be challenging, especially when their loved ones are sick or have already passed away. At Pure Passage, we understand how important it is to fulfill this obligation for your loved ones. That's why we offer our professional and reliable service to perform Umrah on behalf of your sick or deceased parents, spouse or any other relatives. We believe that everyone should have the opportunity to fulfill this sacred act even if they are unable to do so themselves and equally understand that the physical and financial challenges of performing Umrah yourself on behalf of your loved ones can be overwhelming. That's where Pure Passage comes in. We take care of everything and make sure that your loved one's Umrah is performed with the utmost care and attention to detail. So let us help you earn this immense reward for your loved ones by performing Umrah on their behalf. Contact us today and let's make it happen. All right, guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, in the background, you can see it, my journey to Islam. No, unfortunately, we're not talking yet about my journey to Islam, but stay tuned. I will make a separate video. Today, we're going to watch a Scottish girl converted to Islam by the channel Logic and Islam. Before we jump into the video, as always, guys, if you enjoy the content, leave the thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. With no further ado, let's have a look. My name is Maya Wallace. I was born in 1988 in Glasgow. I grew up initially with my mother and father, who were both social workers. And after a few years, we moved to the west of the city, which was just my mum and my brother. Initially my childhood was quite lonely, so I didn't have a, a wide social circle, it was very small, so I would spend my days at school and after school I would come home, so then it would just be me, my mum and my brother and what I would do, we'd watch TV, that was a big feature in our childhood, we didn't do a lot of outdoor activities um, in the sense of things that you would go and pay to do. What we would do would be making jewellery, playing with my dolls. I was very active in lots of sports, gymnastics, athletics. Um, I enjoyed a lot of outings with my mum, biking, ba home baking, things like this. Um, in summer I became very active so I'd go and stay with my grandmother and my grandfather in Ayrshire and it was activity after activity which I loved. We would go swimming every single day um, we would go into town, we would go shopping, um, we would do more baking, which I loved because my gran is an amazing cook. I didn't have any religious views as a child. Um, we didn't grow up with a religion, so there was no Bible in the house, no Quran, there was nothing like that. Um, my family, as a you know, my wider family, so like my aunts and uncles, they were they're scientists. So a lot of the views that I had um, maybe Very came from them. So there was no impact. Do I believe in God? Is there a God? There was no such discussions. I found out when I was much much older, speaking to my mum about religion, that apparently I used to go to Sunday school, but I have no recollection of that whatsoever. 
So in high school I took religious education, uh, much to the dismay of my teachers. Um, I decided to switch. Looking at her, I have to say it is very brave, of course, in such an environment, such a white environment, European environment, to accept Islam. Because as a woman, if you fully accept Islam, you will cover as well. And this, of course, a huge challenge in comparison to men. I didn't have to do anything. When I reverted to Islam, I stayed exactly the same. I have my bald shaved head and a beard. This is it. I don't have to change much. Dress code wise, I usually wear jogging pants and a t-shirt. So there's not much I have to change yet uh, again. For the women, however, they have to be very, very brave because they have to change everything about their outward appearance. So in high school, I took religious education, um, much to the dismay of my teachers. Um, I decided to switch subjects because I wanted to learn a little bit more about religion. At this stage, I had a desire to get some answers, not to adopt a religion, not to become Christian or a Sikh or Catholic. It was just to find the answers to these questions I had since I was a young girl. Now, at school, um, I didn't get those answers. Um, the religions that they taught, they didn't make any logical sense. And I thought, why would I have faith? This is from God, because surely God should be able to explain to me simply the answers. So my high school didn't teach Islam. Uh, the yeah, this reminds me of the quote of Albert Einstein who said, if you cannot explain it to a six-year-old, you don't know the answer yourself. At the time, it was quite superficial. They said that they couldn't teach Islam because they didn't have a religious education teacher who'd studied that religion. Yeah. Either way, I was happy. To me, it wasn't a real religion. It was barbaric. The Muslims were crazy nutcases. <laughs> they were just people that would terrorize innocent people, they would blow up buildings. So for me, I was glad. I didn't think that I would ever become Muslim, that I would ever entertain the idea of Islam. So it's quite ironic Same now. <laughs> I am I am a Muslim. Yep. In so many revert stories I've seen that pattern myself of course included. We come from a background where we hate Islam. We look at it as a foreign entity, something that wants to invade our countries, bomb everything, as she said, terrorize people. But then once you start studying it, your eyes start opening up and lastly your heart opens up and then you revert. I had no interaction with um, people of other ethnicities, of other religions. Um, there was perhaps two or three students in my school but they were very westernized, they had adopted our culture so I had no real ability to see what really is Islam, what is a Muslim. So from there on in I thought well I've learned about the real religions, they're a load of rubbish, I don't believe in them so I just carried on, I just became a normal Scottish teenager. I done what you would expect of any sort of British teenager, I went out clubbing, I drank alcohol, just had a laugh, just, there was, there was no point. To, looking back, I just think, at that time, I thought that's what you did with your life, but it, to me now, it just seems, it just seems It's unfortunate, but she is correct. This is really what I would expect from any British teenager. It's true. Pointless. And where my journey into Islam began was I, in 2005, I started working in a call centre. And in that call centre, it was predominantly Pakistani people that were in there that were Muslims. And they were not crazy. <laughs> they were not anything that I had imagined that the media had portrayed. Um, and in actual fact, they became my best friends. And this is the first time I felt I had real, true friendship where these people really cared for me. I really cared for them. And there was a group of us. So there was Saima, there was Shakila, there was Talib, Nabil and Atif. And it was us us lot together and I would just initially it was just I was interacting with them and we would just do normal things go to the cinema we would go out for meals but one thing that stood out f out to me was the fact that what they done was very respectful they had a lot of respect for themselves they wanted to have a good image there was a lot of things they wouldn't do so they wouldn't come out clubbing with me you know once I had a birthday I invited them and they declined and I couldn't understand why so slowly, slowly, it was just their behaviours, their mannerisms that introduced me to Islam. Lead by example, huh? When I was working in the call centre with the other Muslims, uh, one of the most profound moments for me 
was actually during Ramadan and uh, I remember the moment sort of very clearly. Uh, we, were, we were in the Avon's office in Baird Street and my group of friends that I'd mentioned uh, earlier, they were fasting and they were about to open their fast. And uh, Sam Saima, she actually um, handed me uh, a box of spring rolls that her mother had made and she offered them to me if I wanted some. And to me that was just such a profound moment. You know, here I am having eaten all day, probably not even realising, you know, drinking in front of them, having water or something, and they're offering me food. They're breaking their fast with me. And that was a really profound moment for me. So something happened in that moment, I became curious. It's very interesting to see, of course, this is now in a context of Ramadan, but nevertheless, many Westerners are absolutely surprised and shocked when they see the hospitality of foreigners in general. We come from the Balkan, my family is from the Balkan, from Northern Macedonia. It is absolutely normal for us to invite people to eat. And especially when I was a child and I played with some German kids, of course, my parents would invite them in. Their kids, they would give them food. Here, eat, 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 of course. And they would be so surprised. Their parents would be surprised as well. Oh, they ate already? But if I was in a German household and then it was time for lunch, they would tell me, Okay, go home now. Kevin has to eat. And I was wondering back then as a kid, man, what's wrong with you guys? You're living in such a big house. You don't have a little bit of spare food. I'm a six-year-old kid here. How much will I eat? A little bit of fries, maybe one sausage at best. You don't have a little bit of food left for a kid. What is wrong with you guys? But this is the culture clash, of course. Therefore, it's not surprising to me that this Scottish woman here was shocked when she was met with such a hospitality. What are these it's Muslims normal, doing? Man. They're starving themselves and giving their food away to me. Like, who am I? Why are they doing this? And then I started having questions. You know, what is Islam? Why are they Muslim? You know, are, are these kind attributes that they have, um, their upbringing? Is it just these specific people? Is it part of Islam? What is it? And so I started to ask them questions. I started to inquire, be inquisitive. And something that really shook me is that they weren't proud. Well, I think this, or I feel this, or I know that. They said, this is what the Quran says, this is what the Sunnah says, this is what the Hadith says. They had proof for everything. And never at any point did they say to me, just believe, just have faith. We know this is the truth. They didn't tell me that, they, they gave me the answers. And when they didn't know the answers, they would go and find out. And they would be humble enough to admit, I don't know. I can't answer that, I can't tell you. Yep, and this is one of the strongest points of Islam, of course, that there is an answer to almost everything. You can always look it up. However, this is a talking point of the Islamophobes against Islam as well, apparently. Ultimately, they're just a bunch of liberals, of course, because they tell you, oh, you need a bunch of rules, oh, you need to pray five times per day, you need to observe certain fasts. Some of them even go so far to say that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, had OCD and he was a control freak, just giving people people rules that were all man-made of course. Those people are truly sick in the heart and they're not looking for a religion. They look something that will cater to their desires. Here I was, standing Islam in the face, and it was the truth. I couldn't deny it was the truth. But I wasn't ready to accept being a Muslim. I never wanted to adopt a religion. I just wanted to know the answers and I thought that would be enough. But in learning about Islam, I realized that believing is not enough. Islam is a way of life. They've got their own economical, political, social, legal system. If I was to become a Muslim, yes. if I was to... Accepting Islam is not only a spiritual way of life or a philosophy. It is an ideology that encompasses all aspects of life. Religiously, spiritually, but politically and socially as well. Islam covers all aspects of life. To adopt that identity, everything I'd ever known would have to change. But I didn't know if I could commit to being Muslim. I didn't know if I could commit to what Islam required from me. I so totally I had a, what I would call a trial period and I was going to try so, and see if I could do what Islam required of me. So initially it was simple things for me like stopping eating haram meat. Um, being a vegetarian previously that wasn't so hard for me. Um, then it was stopping drinking alcohol, uh, then it was stopping going out to nightclubs which was a large part of my social life. Um, I started to dress more modestly 
So I went half of my wardrobe um, and slowly, slowly I realised that I was able to overcome these hurdles but still I was apprehensive, you know, it was a lifetime commitment. If I became Muslim, that was it and I wanted to be sure that I could give that commitment to Allah. And it just took a long time to get that courage to take that leap to know that I was doing the right thing and that Allah would see right by me and that my fears would melt away and my, my fear mainly was telling my family how will my mum cope, my brother, you know, my aunt and my uncle, they're not religious, my grandfather and I think that when you're making such a huge life change that you will start to imagine them reacting in ways that aren't even within their character because you're just so scared because it's such a big change and it's something completely different. So every Sunday uh, my mum would... I can absolutely relate here so let's step back first and talk about the trial period so to speak. I did the same thing before reverting to Islam. I already prayed five times per day. No, I did not say the Shahada. Many people thought that I'm already Muslim because when you pray you say the Shahada. I did not do that whatsoever. I simply recited Al-Fatiha and I went through the motions. However, that being said, I want to understand Islam before I accept it because I wanted to know if I will be able to stick to it. I explored so many different things within my lifetime, dietary, spiritually and what not. And therefore I didn't want this to be a fad. I didn't want this to be a phase. I wanted this to be for life and therefore I had to understand myself before I make the decision. Now talking about parents, she said that most parents are not even in the capacity to react the way that she imagines it. Well, that might be true for her parents. My parents are from the Balkan and I'm facing a much harder test there. Me from work and drive me home. And every Sunday I would try and muster up the courage and before I knew it, we were home and I didn't say anything. And this would happen week after week after week. I felt like it was never going to end. Sunday was my day of torment. But then Ramadan was coming and I knew that I wanted to embrace my Islam during Ramadan. I wanted to fast for that month. I wanted to be in that environment. So a few weeks before, I just mustered up the courage and told her. And Alhamdulillah, she accepted it. She just questioned why. But we didn't have a long discussion. We're not a family for having in-depth in conversations, but I told her and the relief, it just washed over me. It made me feel silly. I've been worrying all this time and it went really well. I uh, went with my, my friends, some of my very good friends, same as well, Sam, and we went to Glasgow Central Mosque and I took my shahada through tears of joy. We were all crying, it was so emotional. And it was such a, it was an experience that I wasn't expecting. We went uh, and at first we were told to go to the, the study room and I would take my shahada there with the imam. I wanted to do it properly. I didn't want to do it just with two witnesses, which is all the requirement. I wanted to do it in the mosque, let everyone know, get a certificate, I'm Muslim. <laughs> I found the answers. So we went and the Imam sat me down. He started asking me strange questions. Why do you want to become Muslim? Is someone forcing you? Do you want to do this? And I'm like, yeah, that's why I've came. Please just let me take my shahada. No he just obviously wanted to make sure. It has to come from you. Therefore, it's not a strange question. He has to know. He has to make sure. I knew what Islam is. I knew what being Muslim meant. And then that day, um, I t uh, after I, I prayed, it was the Jummah Friday prayer. So we went and we prayed and I remember feeling so nervous because of all the things I had learned. I didn't know how to pray Jummah. <laughs> so I was standing there on my nerves and I started to forget the, the prayers and the recitation that I'd learned. So I'm copying my friend and I'm like, am I allowed to be looking at her at the corner of my eye? And we prayed and that day was very emotional. The Imam gave a speech and he was saying how there was a birth. That was me, which I found out later because I'm a revert to Islam. I'm a newborn in the eyes of Allah. There was also a marriage and a death in that whole time that I was there. And so in 2009, I finally reverted to Islam. I did change my name, 
for two reasons. One, I didn't really, I wasn't too fond of my original name, but also I wanted something with a bit more meaning. So I chose the name Maya, as I originally called Robin. Yeah, that's a nicer name for sure. My so journey to Islam, to becoming Muslim was very easy. I had a lot of support. I had a lot of friends around me, even my own family. Worse, well, my mother, my brother, they were very supportive of me. Um, I remember when I went to take my shahada, my mum was calling me just to make sure. Good luck, hope everything goes okay. But where my struggles really began was when I started to go to an Islamic class and I met other sisters. And this is where I learned about the proper attire that we should be covered. And um, she didn't know that before. for a long time, I thought, I don't want to cover. My hair is so beautiful. I don't want it to go away. But slowly, slowly, I started to educate myself. I started to learn a lot more about what hijab is, what is the purpose of it. And one of my friends gave me um, just a silly little analogy. They said, I've got two sweets, one covered, one uncovered, and I dropped them on the floor. Which one would you eat? Which one would you take? The yeah, one? I said, the one, one with the, the cover, of course. And they said, well, that's how we view our women in Islam. They are the most <laughs> precious thing to us. Of course, we would want them to be covered. And this is not something that I was being told is what men want. But Yeah, I find this example pretty silly, to be totally honest. The covering itself is something that has been practiced throughout human history. I like the example that it is natural for us to cover up. It is natural to hide certain aspects of our human body in public. And especially in this day and age, actually, where nobody covers anymore, covering becomes even more important because it sets a standard and reverses what has gone wrong. People don't even understand what modesty is anymore because women in the West now really believe if they're wearing shorts and a big cleavage that's absolutely modest because we're bombarded with half-naked women on social media and pornography all day long and this is why people believe that this is what is not modest if you're totally naked and you're having sexual intercourse this might be not modest i don't know but everything else goes and this is why the hijab is a beautiful reminder of what true modesty really is Allah in wants. The eyes this of is our protection yeah this is our safety and I didn't want to go out without it. For me, I loved hijab by this point. I'd, I'd found a love for hijab, I'd found a love for covering. I understood the reasons behind it. And I wanted to fulfill that obligation to Allah. Nice. But I was scared to tell my mum. So I was standing in the kitchen, kitchen and I was ironing my hijab. And I had to tell her I wear hijab now. And she got very angry and she no, was crying real. and it was so painful for me and she's saying this is oppression and at this point I'm not eloquent I can't explain to her I have the knowledge but to give it to her I, I, I don't know where to start I don't know the right place and I'm just shouting back no it's not so I remember walking out of the house and going to my back garden and I was in floods of tears and I was crying my heart out. And I phoned Zara, who had now become my Islamic teacher. Mashallah, she's very good. And I'm crying to her and I said to her, Zara, I have to take it off. I can't do this anymore. And she gave me so much comfort and so much love and so much strength. She said to me, Allah will never give you a test that you cannot bear. There will never be something in your life that you cannot overcome, it is there for a reason. So I found a lot of comfort in her words and I put it on and I wore it and I left the house. And my end point with my wider family came when it was my graduation and my mother and my aunt and my uncle came and I was hiding from them. I was in my graduation gown, I was wearing this big black uh, graduation cloak and a black hijab and I was just all black. Looks and silly. I was nervous, I was so nervous. And um, it was about to begin, so I said, okay, we need to take our seats now, but I'll see you afterwards. I just wanted to get it over and done with. I thought, look, when they see me walk across the stage, they'll see the hijab, maybe they'll talk about it, and then I won't need to be there when she 
sees it for the first time. I won't see that initial moment. And alhamdulillah, that's what happened. It was too late for them to come and greet me before, so I went up stage, I accepted my award, and I came down. And I could see in their faces that they had some apprehension, they were shocked, but they accepted it. My grandfather's not a man of many words, um, so when I went to see him, um, he'd been informed, I believe, by my family that I was Muslim and that I covered. And we've never spoken about it, me and my grandfather. And what he done, he says to me, uh, all of your grandmother's scarves are upstairs in the bottom drawer and I've uh, looked them all out and they're all there for you. You know, for yeah, your... Yeah. And he wouldn't say anything, he just went for your... And that's when I knew that through that trial, through that... V for me, that was a very hardship um, that there was light at the end of the tunnel if you want to call it that there was peace at the end for me and that my family accepted the hijab and that now they understand that yeah and moreover it shows that even in the west women used to wear a covering a hijab if you will my grandma used to cover her hair as well and she would have been the last generation basically because after that my aunts my mother they did not cover any longer christian women back in the day used to cover as well it is just this modernist liberal agenda nowadays that tells you that this is islam and islam is oppressive Everybody used to do it, even in Hinduism and Buddhism, you saw covering. The reasons behind it. It's ridiculous. And uh, you guys don't know this as you're recording it, but I've wanted to wear a baya for a long time. I've wanted to put on the proper covering and I've been too nervous and actually had discussion um, about the abaya um, with Ahmed, who's another revert, and he said to me, Abaya, uh, I hear this for the very first time, is the Abaya the Niqab? You, you will find know. the strength. Um, your husband, he will give you that guidance and you'll be there. So when I was asked to come on this show, I thought, I don't want to go anywhere and like, I know I wear, I'm covered, you know, my arms down to my feet, my, my head. But I said, I don't want to go on and wear my dress. I don't think that's right. I want to be a good example to my sisters out there, to Muslims, to people that are thinking about reverting. So today I put on the abaya for the first time. Okay, that's the abaya. So this whole covering then, yeah? Before I became right. Muslim, um, I was a little bit apprehensive about reading the Quran. I knew it um, was real in Arabic. So I was a bit worried that, you know, little things can I get it in English, which I could. The first one I got, it was just a literal translation. There was no context, there was no understanding. And for me, even though it was written in English, it was like Shakespeare, alien, like, well, I don't know what this book is saying. Um, but thankfully, um, some family friends, um, they, Shakespeare's alien. they gave me a what? Quran and it was a Quran meant for children. I gave the background story. Um, so what happened um, when it was revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that's what started my love even more for this Quran. So now whenever anyone asks me about Quran, I say to them, don't be scared about reading it. You know, I'll give them a copy of it um, that I think would be a good one to read. Because although every single Quran has the same words in it, some are very good at explaining it. And for me, the my, my favorite part of the Quran is in Surah Al-Baqarah. It's in this verse that Allah sets a challenge for the whole of mankind. That if you don't believe that this book is the word of God, then just produce one verse like it. The same style, the same transparency. But if you can match that, then you can disprove Islam. And that was, that had such strong meaning for me because I thought of all these people that say the Quran's not real, Allah doesn't exist, uh, Muhammad made everything up, they'll have lengthy debates for hours and hours, but they won't do this one simple challenge. Write a verse, how long can it take them? But in 1400 years, not one person has been able to do this. And the second part of this, uh, this surah that that meant a lot 
more to me is that Allah goes on to say that you will not be able to that you will not be able to write a verse like it and I just think to anyone out there that's doubting Islam then take this challenge come forth and bring a verse let's see it, we're waiting Islam means everything to me Islam is my whole life I believe it's given me everything that I want not, not materialistic things but it's giving me contentment in my heart it's Peace. Gi given me the understanding to life it's told me why I'm here what I should be doing it's given me comfort knowing that Allah is out there that there is a God that I can uh, worship him and obey him and from I would describe it in humanly terms, in his eyes I'm doing the right thing. You know, no longer do I need to um, lead my life by my own moral compass. I've got God there to tell me what is right and what is wrong. And I know in, in my actions that I'm doing the right thing. It's given me... There is no own moral compass per se. There is a subjective view and that's all you got because your moral compass will differ from the moral compass, quote unquote, of a serial killer. In his eyes, it is absolutely okay to slaughter people. In your eyes, it is not. A vegetarian, a vegan on the other hand, tells you that it's morally not all right to eat animals and to slaughter them. So therefore, morality is not subjective or at least it cannot be if we're looking for a right and wrong. If we say morality is subjective, Objective, then we say, hey, anything goes basically as long as you're all right with it, it must be fine. And of course, this is the argument for many movements nowadays. Hey, as long as you don't hurt anybody, it is a okay, just do what you want. But this is not accurate, and moreover, it is irrational to live your life like this. Because if there is no right and wrong, anything goes. As I said, you can do whatever you want. Why would I even listen to any authority at all? Why would I? I obey certain laws in our society if everything goes. Moreover, if there is no afterlife at all, there is no consequence whatsoever. If my lights go out right now, I won't remember what happened, correct? And if I die in 10, 20, 30 years, I won't remember either what happened. So who cares how long I live? I can kill myself right now, or I can kill everybody around me, I can jump out of the window. Who cares if morality is subjective? This Therefore, we need God, of course, as an objective moral guideline. A much better relationship with my mother. You nice. know, she now, she's a very um, private woman, stiff upper lip sort of thing. Now, every day she tells me she loves me. Um, Mashallah, I would never have found my husband um, had I not become Muslim. He's Muslim, of course. And I just think that is an avenue that if I had never taken my shahada, I would never have experienced That's a lot of this. makeup. It's just, it's overwhelming that my life now feels complete. No longer am I ch chasing after the latest dress or the latest car or job. I have everything I need to keep me content right now at this age. I grew up in an environment where what I was told was that you're meant to go out, you're meant to travel the world, you're meant to experience many different things, date different people, to try and attain something and when you've attained it, get more. Earn money and when you've got money, earn more money. When you drink, learn to drink and then drink a bit more. Um, Never ends. Gluttonous, it was just, you know, and to me it had no real value. It was like, I'm going to live, inshallah, 60, 70, 80 years and I'll have achieved nothing. Yes. Now I understand my place in this world and what I'm here for and that's to obey Allah and complete my duties as a Muslim, spread Islam and be an example to the, the community and my sisters around me. Mashallah. 
All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. Long enough as it is, so I'm going to cut it off here, guys. I said everything I want to say throughout the video. It's absolutely beautiful to see what Islam can do, even in such a remote environment as Scotland, in a town where she wasn't even surrounded by many foreigners. Most people that she met were Scottish. And then later on in her life, she met a few Pakistanis at her job. This is how she found out about Islam, and it absolutely transformed her because it gave her an objective standard of morality, an objective standard of truth. What is right? What is wrong? Is it okay if I go drink, expose my skin, date many men and chase the money? Is this okay? Society tells me it is all right, so therefore it must be true, correct? Appeal to majority. Everybody around me does it, so hey, might as well. This is what we see. Islam is not dependent upon a certain historical time frame. Islam is never changing. So therefore, no matter what society will tell you is good right now, is in right now, you always know what is right and wrong if you remember what Islam tells you. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys, especially lately. It has been absolutely amazing. If I look at my live streams, for example, so much support, so much love. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. As always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.